My name is Isabel Friedenstein and I'm a counsellor here at the Institute. I would like to welcome you all tonight to the Australian Institute of International Affairs and welcome to our online audience. Our speakers tonight will follow our usual format and talk for half an hour with half an hour of questions and answers to follow. We are joined by two speakers tonight. Our first speaker is André Francois Giroux, the Consul General of Canada in Sydney, who will explore Canada's experiences of a hybrid approach to diplomacy and creative industries. Mr. Giroux is joined by Jerome Debac, Director of APAC for Moment Factory, who will speak about Moment Factory's growth in the region. It's a great pleasure to welcome both of you tonight. Uh, thank you, Isabel. So, uh, bonsoir à tous. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, first, I would love to acknowledge the uh, Gadigal people of the Ora Nation, a tradition that we share as, as well in Canada. Uh, the Gadigal people, the traditional custodian on the land on which we are uh, meeting tonight, and pay my respect to their um, elders, past, present, and emerging. Given the, the theme of tonight's discussion, this is even more relevant, I find, because it's all about culture, storytelling, and respect uh, for the land, which is at the heart of everything we do. Um, it's a great honor for me to be able to address you tonight uh, at the New South Wales chapter of the Australian International uh, Institute of International Affairs. I'd like to acknowledge President uh, Ian Lincoln for uh, the wonderful invitation, Isabel for facilitating the discussion tonight, and also Tom uh, Dixon and Jennifer Sale for arranging uh, tonight's uh, gathering. Doing so at a cottage uh, underlines how our diplomacy is all about connecting, uh, communicating, and forming bounds people to people and nation to nation. So being in, in this intimate setting, a cottage, is, is I think is, is marks the point of, of that at the end of the day, diplomacy is about connections, connections and people to people interaction. I would say it's all about building trust and respect. Uh, without the trust and respect, it's very hard for a country to advance its interest because at the end of the day, it's not about friendship, it's about interest. Countries have interest, not friends. I know it sounds very harsh, but it is the, the hard reality of, of international relations. But you will all agree with me that it's so much easier to do business with your friends, <laughs> although you are pursuing your interests. When, when, when you are among friends, it's so much easier to see each other's interests and, and find those solutions that are actually win-win at the end of the day. And then the reason why we, w we wanted to highlight the uh, intersect between diplomacy and culture is because we feel that culture is a great uh, way of, of building that trust and, and uh, respect. Uh, for example, um, I, I, was, uh, I was in Adelaide just a few weeks uh, ago uh, for the opening of Illuminate, and Jerome, which was with me, uh, was there as well, uh, and it was to celebrate uh, can the Canadian company called Moments Factory, who was the str central feature of Illuminate. Uh, their work merges technology, imagination and people. So, so Moment Factory resonate. The show was really at the heart of, of uh, is, is still playing in, in Adelaide Illuminate. Uh, and I would say it's uh, until the end of the month and it's definitely worth the detour. But we were there for the premiere of Resonate and it was such a wonderful uh, opportunity for us, me. Uh, we call ourselves a Canada team uh, down under. Uh, to, to represent our wonderful country and then resonate. Moment Factory gave us the perfect uh, uh, excuse to be there, but it also uh, provided us, me with a unique exposure and access to Adelaide's political, business, and cultural leaders. And after having experienced such a wonderful evening together, I can tell you that uh, everything becomes possible. Because at the end of the day, I am in the business of getting people's attention. And then when you have a, such a wonderful show <laughs> like it Resonate, you actually get people's attention. And once you have their attention, then you can start engaging. But, so this is, in a nutshell, uh, I guess, the, 
the lessons from 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 our experience is that through culture you 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 connect and and through connection then you can really advance your interest and that brings me to um, to t today's uh, discussion which is the importance of cultural industries and soft power diplomacy and our experience as you know, culture is the lifeblood of a vibrant society. It's all about telling our stories. It's about celebrating, remembering the past, entertaining ourselves, and imagining the future. So that's culture. Then soft power is about the ability to co-opt rather than coerce. And then for a country like Canada, a country like Australia, this is definitely our preferred way of, of, of advancing our interests. It's not banging on the table and saying, this is how it's going to be. It is engaging and trying to because at the end of the day it's all about influence and influence is, is the ability to make uh, others um, to convince uh, or dissuade from taking a specific course of action so 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 building that trust that respect prov gives you that influence that eventually you'll be able to use in order to advance your interest uh, just uh, a few weeks ago, I was back in Canada for a what we call a um, global head of mission meeting. So we brought, for the first time uh, in five years, uh, COVID was <laughs> a reason why we were not able to do it. But normally we try to do it every second year. We brought all of our head of mission uh, that are all from all over the world together to sort of reset the conversation. And, and it was a moment where the government, my government, decided to launch its futures, future of diplomacy. So in, 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 it, in, in, in the future of diplomacy vision, there is a recognition of the importance of connections as a way of advancing uh, our interests going forward. And then it, it talks about the importance of building relationships, and then which often are done behind the scene. But when you have those relationships, then you have the global influence that you can then take, bring it to bear uh, when and where it matters. So again, it's a recognition that you know, without relationship, without trust, without uh, um, uh, that uh, respect, you don't necessarily, uh, you're, you're, it's, it's becoming harder. And at the end of the day, it's all about pursuing your interests. We call it prosperity and security, but this is what we're, we're striving to achieve. Uh, so uh, when it comes to Canada and Australia, I think we can all agree that uh, we are very much alike. But we are also very much different. But, but when we look at the similarities between our two uh, countries, uh, culture is, is definitely one of the things that glue us uh, together. Uh, we are very, we are at uh, literal opposite end of the world. And then that distance also, I think, makes our similarities even more important. Um, we have shared values and experience. But our commonality are, are, are quite long, the list, just to name a few. I mean, we both have large territories. Um, we have our indigenous uh, connections, our commonwealth heritage. We have our multicultural present. And that present, a, a multicultural present, is also part of our strength. Because we, just like Australia, embrace diversity and, and feel that uh, this is one of our, the foundations of, of who we are as modern country and, through, and that diversity is also expressed through our culture. And as middle power, uh, with similar challenges and opportunity, no doubt that we can find ourselves competing from time to time, but also we recognize that we have so much more to, to gain by, by working together. Um, and instead of necessarily being uh, competing with each other, although we do from time to time. <laughs> it's inevitable and competition is good. Um, but I would just, before I turn to, to Jérôme, I'd just like to highlight some of the sort of very concrete examples. We talked about Resonate in Adelaide just a few weeks ago. Still going on, please uh, don't hesitate to, uh, to, to go if you have a chance. But uh, festivals, 
countries of festival. Australia is a definitely a country of festivals. And then whether you call it the Adelaide Festival, the Cirque Fest uh, Festival in Brisbane, or closer to, to home here, the Sydney Festival, the Sydney Biennale, the Sydney Film Festival or the Queer Film Festival, we are using all of these festivals to really promote what Canada, Canada culture has uh, to offer. And these festivals offered us a, a wonderful platform to, uh, to showcase uh, our, our talent, but also bring audience together. And again, I always go back to, apologies, I always go back to, um, to the fact that at the end of the day, it's all about bringing people together and going through a share, a, a share experience. And then, and then we can also bring innovation, just like uh, Jérôme is going to talk about with Moment Factory. But it can also be classic culture, like uh, what you would you would see at Sydney Writers Week or uh, Story Fest. But also uh, the musical Come From Away, which toured across Australia uh, the, these past uh, three years. And and one big scoop for you is is South by Southwest is coming, and in Canada we'll have a Canada House for three days, and we're very excited. That's in October here in Sydney. And then we will be using that Canada House to showcase the best of what Canada can offer. But we will also use that Canada House as a way of bringing people together, giving them a, a unique experience, and, and, and use that connection then to advance our, uh, our, uh, our mutual uh, partnership and interest. One of the things um, that we do very well here in Sydney, and because it's not something we necessarily do. So I guess we, we do it very well in Sydney, and I'm, I'm joined with um, Nicola Chartrand, who is our trade commissioner responsible for creative industry, is, is we have our cultural diplomacy team work hand in hand with our creative industry trade promotion team. Because bringing an artist for a wonderful performance, open doors, create connections, wonderful. But if you can then make sure that from that performance, the industry, the creative industry follows, then it's even better. So you not only create connections, but you also create longstanding um, a trade uh, benefit, which is also uh, something that we, uh, we value very much. And then you know you can uh, broaden it to food, sport, and science. And believe me, we will get quite a bit of the the sport <laughs> uh, diplomacy uh, in the coming days. On Thursday, it would be the opening uh, of the FIFA Women Football Tournament World Cup uh, here in Sydney at the stadium. So this is uh, definitely another area that is uh, that is very important to to mark the point. Why, you, would, you may ask, because at the end of the day, Canada, just like uh, Australia, is an Indo-Pacific. And then we feel that we have very much an interest, a shared interest with Australia to work together to make sure that we have a safe, secure, peaceful, rule-based uh, region. And then you can all appreciate, when you look at the status of the world today, that this this is not necessarily a given. So again, a shared interest of, of making sure that this region is uh, definitely, um, uh, we, will, we will build and maintain uh, it so that uh, we, we can all enjoy the, the, peace, the peace that comes with it. Um, so just uh, about uh, nine months ago, we launched our Indo-Pacific strategy as a recognition that uh, Canada's interests are very much uh, in this region. Uh, and one of the pillar of that strategy is also recognition that uh, we will not achieve our objective without a strong people-to-people -people connection. And as part of those people-to-people -people connections, cultural diplomacy is also one of the, the, the tools that we want to use. Uh, to, to advance because, again, it's all about creating these connections and the access that uh, it provides. Which brings me to the business of culture. And uh, just uh, a few weeks ago, we brought here in, in Australia a, a cult creative industry mission. Uh, they came to Sydney and went to Melbourne afterwards 
26 representatives, four subsectors, and very quickly followed by 20 industry leaders that attended the Australian Performing Art Market. So a lot of interest, uh, lots of artists coming here, but also lots of proceeds and, and good business. And bo for both Canada and Australia, the uh, creative sector is a significant contributor to the GDP. So this is definitely um, win win and an area where we uh, also strive together is when it comes to indigenous arts this is an area that we're in canada in the context of reconciliation we definitely prioritize and then i know in australia there's uh there's been a lot of good opportunities and just um just uh, a few months ago during wall pride uh, we had the um, the privilege of uh, bringing to uh, australia uh, indigenous to s LGBTQ plus um, uh, in, uh, artist from Canada, and that uh, really created a wonderful, wonderful opportunities again for for connections. So, I mean, in a nutshell, um, the front stage cultural performance really does open doors for what we would call backstage diplomacy. And this is uh, something that we do uh, on a daily basis uh, here uh, in Australia. And thanks to uh, Nicola and his team, we also uh, like to believe that we create w good uh, partnerships that are very uh, uh, productive for both, uh, for both uh, side of the, uh, for, bo for both parties. So, um, but you know, enough. <laughs> about the theory, and, and, and maybe I can turn to uh, Jérôme. As I said, uh, Jérôme is, uh, is with uh, Moment Factory, and we were both together in Adelaide uh, a few weeks ago for um, not only the premiere of Resonate, but also Mirror Mirror, which is another uh, experience that Moment Factory has showcase being showcased right now in, uh, in Adelaide. Uh, and then Jerome can share his perspective on the business side because thank you, thanks to him, um, we, we get uh, the profile, the access that we are striving for, but at the same time, uh, it's, it's, it's nice to, uh, to appreciate uh, behind the scene <laughs> performance as well. So uh, Jerome, um, do you want to yeah. come from? So thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, so my name is Jerome. Uh, I'm originally from France. Uh, so I'm not a real Canadian, but I do speak French Canadian a bit. Um, I've been working for Moment Factory for the last four years. Uh, Moment Factory is a multimedia studio. So what we do is we create light shows, interactive experiences, very similar to the type of insta installation that you will see at Vivid. I'm sure most of you know Vivid. So we do this kind of stuff. We do big projection mapping. We do um, interactive, immersive spaces. And um, in Adelaide, we had a, a, an, an amazing opportunity. So about um, three years ago, in, uh, in 2020, uh, at the beginning of you know, the, the COVID crisis, we, we got a phone call from um, Lee and Rachel, who are the founder of uh, Illuminate Adelaide Festival. And they were looking for a key attraction to launch a new winter festival. So uh, let's say a mini Vivid Adelaide style. And at the time it was, Moment Factory had never done any work in Australia and we could not really travel because of all the COVID restrictions. So it was, it was a, a, a real gamble for them to contact an Australian company and ask us to be present for their first edition. So we started to engage with them and very rapidly what happened is we've discovered that there were a lot of similarities in the way we approach our industry. They had a lot of expertise and experience in their uh, festival organization side, and we had a lot of expertise in our show side, and combining our skill set was really a, an amazing recipe. And usually when we work with new clients, we like to be very close to them to understand how they operate and make sure that there is alignment, because in the creative industry there's so much room for interpretation that when you do a first project with a, f a new client, there's a lot of room for, I would say, misunderstanding. And what was really amazing is that the, I would say the cultural fitness between the two companies uh, was almost instant. Very rapidly, we felt that 
we understood each other, and that's where you know the the, com the the I would say the similarities between the Canadian way of doing business and the the level of professionalism and the Australian way of doing business and level of professionalism really made that possible. And then we went through a very strange process because usually when we create shows we spend a lot of time on site but because we could not go there we had to set up a sort of mirror model so we had a forest in canada called the forest lab where we set up all the installations that we wanted to display in adelaide and they replicated our lab sort of speak in the botanic garden and that way we were able to sort of test different setup and make sure that whatever our creative came up with in Canada could be replicated in the final and the real environment of the garden. And that was a really interesting process because it was the first time for Moment Factory to give so much trust to uh, a foreign company. And uh, usually we always keep tight control of all our uh, creative process. And it worked amazingly well. It, uh, it surprised everyone, including you know, the, the client. And what happened is when we launched the first show, um, that was in um, in uh, June 2021. So at the time, I don't know if you remember, at the time there was no international travel, no interstate travel. So all we managed to fly four people from Canada one week before the show opened, but the entire preparation and design of the show was made with Australian staff that were collaborating through Zoom calls, etc with our Canadian team. And when our Canadian team arrived, they had the amazing surprise to discover that what they had uh, created in Canada was really, really well uh, delivered by the, the team in, in Australia. And, and to me, that's a really interesting lesson because the trust factor that you mentioned uh, earlier is exactly the, the, the secret ingredient of this uh, successful collaboration. The, the way we've been communicating with them and the, the compatibility of mind, I would say, really made this possible. And as a comparison, we had a similar kind of project happening in China with the same challenges, not being able to travel, uh, having to do a lot of remote communication, etc. And that one has been an absolute nightmare. I can tell you the, the cultural misalignment between our team in Canada and the team in China was absolutely disastrous. We spent three times the amount of hours that we had planned in the budget to deliver the China project versus the Australian project. And everybody in our team was very frustrated uh, because the end product was not at the level that we hoped. So we, we, we had a, a direct comparison with two similar type of project and two different culture. And it's not to say that one is right or one is wrong. It's just that the compatibility of culture and the easiness of communication was the key factor that made the difference between these two projects. And so we had the, the first show in 21 with Adelaide, which was a surprising success because at the time nobody could travel. So the festival was mainly for people in Adelaide and they, um, they had 80,000 visitors the first year, which was you know, really, really impressive. Then the second year we delivered the same show and uh, the second year they had 120,000 visitors. So for, for a light show in the middle of a garden in Adelaide, it was really, really impressive. And uh, we started building this relationship with the team uh, in Adelaide. And what we've discovered is that it was the foundation for a long-term relationship. So now we are doing this third year of collaboration. We have two shows this year with them. But what we are planning to do also is to bring this show around Australia to all these shows to bring them to Sydney, bring them to Brisbane, etc. And the team in Adelaide is actually going to help us do that. So what started as a single project for a festival in the middle of COVID grew into a long-term relationship. And you know, for us, the, the future is even brighter because thanks to this relationship, we have people we can trust and we can work with. And we can really build a business that is a mutual benefit because for us, it allows us to grow our business in Australia. But for the team in Australia, it was also an opportunity to discover new type of project, new ways of collaboration, and also an opportunity to actually expand their team. Because now if we take these shows and bring them to other cities, we will leverage the presence of the local staff and we won't be flying 20 or 30 people to deliver these shows, we'll be using the local people. So it's really, for us, it's really a win-win in the sense that you know we've created a new product, we've 
developed it together, and now we're going to be able to exploit it. Well, that's the, in a nutshell, <laughs> the journey of uh, Moment Factory here in Australia. Um, I don't know, is there any other topic you want me to maybe address? Yeah, I remember you had questions from the last session. Yes. Um, Go hit me with your question. Uh, how, uh, how are all, uh, Australian audience in the market uh, compared to what you would see in Canada? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> uh, so I would say there are a lot of similarities, more similarities than differences between Canadian audiences and Australian audiences. And that's probably also why the show that we brought was successful. Um, one of the key differences, it's not so much an audience, it's more like a market specific. In Canada, it's usually the price point of a ticket for accessing this type of show is around $20. When in Australia, it's more like $40. The, the pricing of cultural or immersive experiences in Australia is much higher. So for us, from a business point of view, it's much more attractive to actually deliver a show or sell a show in Australia than in Canada. So there is this main difference. But in terms of, I would say, appetite and behavior, there's, there are similarities. The Australian audience um, are very used to um, digital and innovative experiences. So they have this sort of appetite and they also have the, I would say, the taste and the capability to s make the difference between good shows and bad shows. So uh, hopefully we keep doing good shows <laughs> and we don't fall into the bad show category. But uh, yeah, that I would say that's, that, that's the, you know, the, the main thing is the pricing is the difference, but the rest is very, very similar. So, um, Jerome, uh, you, you mentioned you were originally from France. So yeah. how did you end up uh, working for Moment Factory here in Sydney of all places? Ah. That's, that's a long story, very international. So I, I actually moved to Australia in 2010, lived here for six years. Then I was sent to Hong Kong to open an office for an Australian company where I spent three years. Then I was hired by Moment Factory to move to Singapore to open the Singapore office for them, which was July 19. And six months after I landed there, COVID hit and basically everything was put on on the shelf and I worked for home, from home for two years <laughs> behind my computer which was not so fun and then after two years when things started to reopen um, my family actually wanted to go back to Australia because the quality of life here is really hard to beat even though Singapore is a beautiful city I can tell you we're much better here than uh, over there so we decided to come back here but continue to grow the uh, APAC region from, from Sydney and basically I've been working working with Moment Factory from Australia now for the last two years. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah. I've done a big loop from France to Australia, Hong Kong, Singapore, and back to Sydney. So, so one of the things we, we like to say about Canada is we're, we're wonderful. Um, uh, if, if you have an interest in, in the North American market, we say come to Canada, and then you can serve the North American market out of Canada. I guess what you're telling us is that Australia is also, I know Australia is also positioning itself as being like a, uh, a stepping platform, stone, yeah. a platform for, yeah. for the Indo-Pacific or the uh, Asian uh, market, but how does that work for, for Moment Factory and, and yourself being based in Sydney but having a, a broader regional mandate? So, well, the funny thing is we almost did it reverse. We, we have already a really great portfolio of clients in, in Asia. So Hong Kong, um, Singapore, Tokyo, Korea, and uh, China. And finally, Australia was never really on the map, so to speak, uh, for Moment Factory until I joined them. And I told them, hey guys, there's this amazing market where people really like the type of product, project that we do. So we should you know, move there. And that's basically, so from Singapore, I started growing the Australian market. But uh, now that I'm here, I keep looking after the region. Um, I have to say that what is really uh, interesting being in Australia is access to a lot of qualified resources. Because in the creative industry in Asia, it's really hard to find good people. Uh, because creative jobs are not well regarded in Asian societies. It's still, you know, people want their kids to be doctors or lawyers or, or um, work in, you know, 
the, the finance industry, but if they want to be artists, it's, it's not really well uh, accepted. Uh, when I think in Australia, it's much more valued. And so for us, having access to a pool of talent and skilled uh, resources is really important. So that's, that's one real benefit of being here. Mm -hmm. The other one is, uh, what I've discovered is that there's a lot of Australians who have worked all over Asia, sorry. And there's a lot of knowledge, cultural knowledge, of how, what it is to work in Malaysia, or in Singapore, or in Hong Kong. And this makes a huge difference when you work with teams who have that understanding of how to deal with Asian clients or deal with Asian vendors. It's you, you know, 50% of the work is already done. The rest is more like the mechanics. But uh, I find that it's, it's one of the key advantage of Australians and being in Australia is that you have access to this sort of network of people who have that international understanding. Yeah? You want to go for questions? Yes, Thanks. Thank you both so much for such an interesting discussion. Um, we'll now open the floor for some more questions from the audience. Please wait for the intern to pass you the roaming mic before you ask your question. Do we have one mic each? Oh no, only this one. Oh no, that's a light. Hello, it's a um, question for Jerome. Yeah. Um, you've obviously brought your show from Canada to Australia. Do you think you could take Vivid to Montreal? Um, personally, me, no. <laughs> but uh, there are installations from Vivid that could definitely be uh, displayed in, uh, in Montreal. Uh, there is a, a place in Montreal called Quartier des Spectacles, who's like the sort of... Um, Show, show sector where they do all the festivals and there's a lot of uh, opportunities for Australian companies to actually display their work. Uh, so yes, absolutely. Not, uh, not the entire Vivid because it's too big, but definitely some of the installations. And I'm sure they already do. Actually. What about in, in Ottawa, the um, Canadian Parliament building? I've never been there, so it's hard <laughs> for me to answer that. Maybe you so, can so take that So we, we do... Uh, we do project, uh, it's not quite like uh, the sale of the Opera House, but <laughs> we do project on the, uh, on the Parliament building. Um, usually in the winter lute, we project uh, fire, uh, snowflakes, uh, Canada Day, we will project the things that are thematic. So yeah, there are definitely uh, opportunities there for sure. Okay, thank you. Just one question for you. Um, you're certainly aware that um, Australia is about to have this referendum for The Voice. And uh, I lived for two years in Ottawa, so I'm well aware of the similarities between the way you include your Indigenous people as we do. Um, how does Canada constitutionally recognise your people, or if you haven't, how have you avoided the voice referendum that we're now having? So uh, I guess the, the, the main difference is that there is, uh, in the original Canadian constitution, there were an article that recognized the, the rights of, of uh, indigenous Canadian. Uh, and that, uh, that uh, constitutional uh, mechanism has also allowed courts to uh, recognize the treaties that were signed. Uh, so so it, right now, if, if you look at the, um, the legal uh, framework. Uh, we, we have treaties, oral and, and written, that have been recognized by courts and, and a lot of this is, is also anchored into the fact that the Constitution uh, original, originally did uh, recognize that uh, people who were there had some, some rights. It's not, of course, it's like anything in life, it's not black and white and there's a lot of gray area. And it's a constant uh, conversation, uh, but I have to say that um, our courts, tribunal, uh, tribunals, have been fairly progressive in in in, uh, in recognizing uh, the fact that, um, as as I said, oral treaties uh, may not have had uh, a piece of paper, but they were ev enough evidence to demonstrate that that they were un undertaking and 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 commitments that were made and then therefore recognize them in under modern, modern law. Okay. And, and we have the tradition of modern treaties as well, so which is also something that we, uh, so they were uh, treaties that were uh, 
came into agreement 100 years ago, but we also have the tradition, of, we are still in the process of uh, settling some of the, the land claims through, and we call it modern treaties. So that's, that's, a, that's an ongoing process as well, and it's all part of reconciliation, yes. Yes. Jerome, it's interesting you describe the cultural well, boo boo or dislocation with your work with China. It, is, is it because in the ang Anglo Saxon fear, it's easier to work together? The, the five eyes, the, you know, the, so you all speak the same language. Mm -hmm. And given that now you have worked in uh, Asia, the understanding of Asian culture, uh, Therefore, are you able to remedy? Interestingly, my observation is that, that uh, remember in Bali, the Canadian Prime Minister, not, not Macron, what's, what's his name? Uh, your, your Trudeau had some beef with Xi Jinping. Uh, isn't that a, a, another cultural dislocation or misunderstanding of each culture rather than the white Anglo-Saxon sphere? Um, I think there are, I mean, it's a multi-layer subject. There's not a single answer to that. But the, what I've observed in you know, most of the projects that we've done across Asia, and China is not unique. Japan is exactly the same uh, type of setup. It's just the, the two key elements are communication and mutual understanding. Oh. And, and really what what ha we've been struggling with is, I would say, a, a lack of cultural intelligence from both sides. So on the Canadian side, we had a lot of people in our team who had never worked with Asian clients, and they could not understand what the client was asking for. You know, when, when our client was saying, I want blue, they were not meaning that blue, they're meaning the other blue. But if you don't have people on, on both sides that have the experience of working with these different cultures, it makes it really, really hard. And on the uh, China side, the way they do business is very different to the way we do business in Canada or even in, in Europe. And so you had all these different layers of complexity where, you know, negotiating the contract took two years. That, you know, it, it should not take two years, but because we had to go through all these sort of, oh, that's what you mean, oh, that's what you want. It took a lot of time, and the, the process of delivering a creative project was exactly the same. Plus, you add the element of complexity that creativity is subjective. When you say, oh, this flower is beautiful, it's beautiful for me, but maybe you find it ugly. So ha having that from two countries that have very different type of flowers made it even more complex. In the end, we managed to get to, I would say, a, a result where everybody is kind of happy, but I think both sides of the table were, were frustrated that they were not heard and understood all the time. And that is, but to me, it's not the fault of one side or the other. It's both sides of, of the, com both companies were trying and struggling to figure out what the other side was trying to do or achieve or ask. Plus, the added complexity was we could not travel. And as you probably know, in Asia, a, a way to solve a problem is to sit together at a table and have a dinner and go through that problem. But we could not do that. We were stuck to Zoom calls. And to be honest, I would say that 50% of the challenge of this project was due to the inability to be physically present together to work through these problems. Thank you both. Um, Jocelyn, I'm one of the councillors here. And as a, someone who's worked in cultural diplomacy, so I'm particularly interested in the topic of tonight's talk from both of you. Um, my question, I, I really like your um, expression about connections. It's all about connections. Um, and uh, it seems to me that if we compare Australia and Canada, although there are many, many similarities, many connections, uh, there's one glaring difference, which is that you have two official languages, 
and we have one and in my view we are although we're both multicultural nations we are too monolingual we don't have in enough people with language ability so i would like to ask you um is it a strength for cultural diplomacy to have two languages or is it a weakness uh, and in particular you know looking at the francophone part of the world uh, it seems to me australia is really handicapped in reaching out so have we do we just relinquish all of that part of the world to canada and and say go with our blessing or what should we be doing yeah, learn french <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well uh, we in in language official languages so so you you are completely right at the federal level we have two official languages but i'm always reminded when i travel throughout canada that for example if you're in the in nunavut which is one of the, and talking about recognition, Nunavut is, is our most recent territory, which was created as a result of a land settlement with the Inuit who lived in the Northwest Territories. So it is a modern treaty that created that territory. I think they have 15 official languages uh, at the parliament in Nunavut. So it's just, again, it, it's, a, it, it's a recognition of that language. But, you are, I would say there's, it's definitely a strength uh, for Canada to have these two official languages. Lucky in the sense that the other official language, our two official languages are two languages that are widely spoken around the world. Probably would be very different if it was a, a language that is, is hardly spoken outside of, of Canada, for example. So, so the fact that French is, is, is spoken on all continent um, and that uh, I, I don't know by heart all the statistics, but there are quite a few million people around the world that speaks French. It does open a lot of doors, and it does create those those special connections, like we we have uh, among Anglo-Saxon uh, uh, countries, I guess, who, who all who all share English as 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 a language. So it it has helped us uh, in our diplomacy, and it has helped us. Uh, uh, in, 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 in part of Africa where it's very prevalent, in the Middle East and other, and, and other area. As a uh, fellow francophone, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what would be your, uh, your take on, on Canada's bilingualism? Yeah, I think um, it's definitely a key advantage. And there's, I mean, my wife is a primary school teacher and she's been teaching in bilingual schools for all her career. And she's done a lot of research and study and what she have read uh, is that children who grow up in a bilingual environment have a much more flexible brain and are more, I would say, open to the, the world. So there is a key advantage of having a multilingual uh, environment. But in the same time, I mean, being a migrant to Australia, um, what I feel is that even though the official language is English, you have a lot of different languages in the country because it's a multicultural society made of immigration. So you have people speaking Chinese and Vietnamese and uh, Croatian. So maybe you're not fully bilingual, but you have a population that is made of a lot of bilingual people. So to me, you already have a component of that richness. And it's, if, if it's not as visible as in Canada or recognized, I think it's still something that is very powerful for the, the Australian community. And, uh, and I'm myself, I'm Australian, I have citizenship, and I feel really proud of that. I think it's very rare for someone to become a citizen of a new country. And I remember the day I had my ceremony, I felt really, really emotional, because it's like you know being welcomed in a new family. And I think Australia has that richness of welcoming people. And to me, it's more important than the official language. It's the openness of your mind. Well said. Um, congratulations on the, the strength of the partnership that you have with Adelaide Festival um, and that collaboration, that connection. Um, my question is just to hear your comments around a broader context and the power that can come out of those sort of collaborations. So in a, in a cultural context, 
you can have a light show, you can have dance, music, writing, theatre, whatever it may be, that can influence a broader audience. So I'm wondering in terms of that connection, comments around what is the place of using that cultural position, power, message, to reach into that broader context where you can build perhaps stronger, better communities, placemaking, for example. Absolutely. So I'm just interested to hear your comments on that. So I'm not sure how to answer that, but what, what we've experienced, so Moment Factory does, 80% of our work is overseas, is not in Canada. So our teams are constantly traveling the world and creating these new connections and bringing that expertise or creativity abroad. So we're really proud of that. But more importantly, what I find really interesting is all our creative people are fed by these connections. So the fact that we work with so many different cultures in so many different countries is actually a major asset because it brings different visions and different angles to our creative people and it broadens their perspective. They, they become much better at creating because they are constantly confronted to different types of clients. You know, we were talking about China earlier or Japan or Korea. Each one of these projects is a learning opportunity for us. And I think probably one of our strengths is that, I would say, multicultural um, approach to business. Uh, we, we do business in probably, I don't know, 50 or 60 different countries. We have 80 shows that are currently operating around the world. And that means a lot of complexity. It's an absolute nightmare to manage from an operational point of view. But the richness that we get from that through the experience that our staff are having by traveling to foreign countries um, and working with people who have a different vision and who have a different understanding of colors and shapes, etc., is actually a strength. So I don't know, did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. yeah sort of. <laughs> Well, yeah. Well, we are a creative company and we do entertainment. So, I mean, I think it will be a bit arrogant from us to think that we can save the world. <laughs> what we do is we just bring some joy to people's life and try to make them, you know, have have a good moment and create memories. Uh, but that's where diplomacy is stepping in. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it very. Uh, you know, we, we stay away from picking and choosing artists. That's not our job. That's for curators to do that. But, but there's no doubt that uh, when curators come to us and ask for, uh, for support, if they uh, can demonstrate that they, the artists that they're selecting, for example, uh, will bring uh, some of the values that we hold dear, which is our respect for human rights, diversity, inclusion, indigenous uh, affirmation and, and culture and, and reconciliation. I mean, it makes my work so much easier than to, to go back to Ottawa and say, hey, uh, there's a wonderful opportunity here. So, so we do believe very s strongly that um, uh, it's not always possible. And as I said, we're not picking and choosing, but, but but when, when, when the cultural uh, experience does allow us to promote the values that we share, uh, I, I believe that it helps uh, advancing those, uh, those understanding ar around the world. So there is there's the powerful message of, 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 I mean, artists can be very strong and powerful communicators of, of values. So, and that's, that's where we, we think it, it has its merit in itself, it opens door, and there's a wonderful industry behind it. So it's like win, win, win. No. Well, actually, I have, I have one, one answer to your question. Uh, we, we've started working on a project in New Zealand with uh, a Maori group, and the, the idea is to create a, you know, nighttime illumination in a forest. But the forest is a sacred forest, and there's a lot of very deep and meaningful stories. And our role here is to provide a platform for this community to tell their story. So the way we can impact positively this community is by giving them the tools to express their culture through a different lens. 
or something that is modern and that is also going to contribute to their economy because it's a paid attraction. So it's going to generate revenues for the community, but also jobs for the local uh, community. So that that's one way that we feel we contribute. Hello. Um, I just have a question in relation to, I guess, shared values between um, and initiatives between um, Australia and Canada when it comes to um, the Indigenous side of things. I'm a dual Canadian Australian and I've spent most of my life in Australia, um, but I'm Inuk on my dad's side and I think I've grown up just always making connections about shared values when it comes to the Indigenous side of things um, because obviously that was my education in Australia but I had a completely different um, home life and I guess I wanted to ask what sort of projects or if there is any that celebrate and explore shared values and I guess draw out that comparison as well. Yeah, uh, it is definitely one of the focus area and when when we we have a chance to influence, to support, to uh, to facilitate um, uh, indigenous to indigenous connections is definitely very high on our list. Uh, we um, for during World Pride, we uh, we were all over the place. Canada, we really uh, embraced uh, the the diversity and inclusion that World Pride brought uh, to Sydney. But we, uh, when was the time to to bring uh, artists? We we felt that it would be important to to also bring even more diversity. So we 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 prioritized um, Indigenous L the two S L G B T Q uh, artists. Which I, 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 I thought was was a wonderful because they, they they were here and were able to make all these connections uh, with uh, with local uh, communities and, and 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 they're all coming back <laughs> and they will be back so it, it has proven very uh, very uh, fruitful and, 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 and useful um, we um, we will be at uh, connect. 23, I guess. Uh, so Supply Nation has its uh, big um, a trade fair uh, in August. And last year we were the only foreign government present. And then this year we will be there again. And again, we are, uh, because we believe it's it's not so much culture, but it is indigenous to indigenous business. And then our hope is to bring an indigenous delegation, uh, not this year, unfortunately. But, but, but we will be there, we will uh, make those connections, and then the idea is, is eventually to bring it, a, a, an Indigenous Canadian uh, delegation of business people to, to come to Australia. So, so this is definitely a, an area where we feel there's a lot uh, of similarities and potential between Canada uh, and, and Australia. So, uh, so yes, thank you for, <laughs> for the question. I wonder if you could make some comments about how Canada maintains and supports uh, its cultural diplomacy with a cultural juggernaut to the south. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it, you know, because we have that uh, dual, those two languages and, and I guess dual cultural heritage in addition to our uh, indigenous uh, roots, um, it's always easier for French Canadian to feel a little different, but I know for English Canadian, it, it's English Canadians can so easily be mistaken for for Americans and things like that. So it is always a bit of a of a challenge, um, but but we uh, we're agnostic, <laughs> so very much like Australia, right? Uh, what makes a, 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 a good Canadian production? Uh, it can be uh, a show that uh, it can be pretty much anything as long as we have we have a substantial Canadian talent in it. We 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 
tend to claim it <laughs> and make it our own. So uh, I don't know if that uh, that explains your um, your, but we uh, I think it is it is very much uh, as much as you know uh, being in the shadow of such a great country as the United States. Uh, can create its challenges. Overall, uh, for Canada, it's been a real, uh, a wonderful opportunity because it is a very dynamic and, and prosperous uh, country, which is just a hundred hundred an hour drive from most, uh, where 90% of the Canadian uh, uh, live. So uh, we, uh, but obviously, we, we do have programs to, uh, to, to, to promote Canadian culture, but you know, I think any multicultural country would, would struggle a little bit sometimes of what's, what is truly a Canadian cultural product. We tend to, um, and then just like, a, I'm, sh I'm sure Australia is very similar, but we're very inclusive in Canada. So, uh, so we will, if you move to Canada and you become a successful artist, we will claim you. <laughs> <laughs> Even though you've been naturalized for two minutes, we will claim you. And, and it's been very successful in that sense. I mean, if, if you look at, 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 at some of our uh, cultural products, uh, they, I mean, they could be uh, Iranian, uh, you know, uh, produced, well, Canadian Iranian uh, filmmaker, director doing a, 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 a cultural product that is about, you know, the reality in Iran, but we will, we will very much see this as one of ours. Uh, so that's our way of, I guess, being inclusive. Okay, so we can claim your own, is that correct? Yes, exactly. <laughs> and then he's, he's told you how, how moving what he was. <laughs> but no, you're right. I think this is, but uh, truly I was, I was just talking to, uh, to Nicola um, earlier today about uh, the, 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 my experience. One of my counterpart when I was in New York, uh, my Australian uh, counterpart was actually a naturalized, a Canadian naturalized Australian who was now a, an Australian diplomat representing Australia. And he was my counterpart. And I think this is, uh, and, and I have similar experience, you know, Australian naturalized uh, Canadian who are my colleagues now representing Canada abroad. And I think this is the, it's, it's unique to, to our countries. I, I, many, many, it wouldn't be possible in so many countries. And I think it is a tes testimony to the inclusiveness uh, and welcoming uh, of, our, uh, of our societies. That we would, you know, uh, actually accept that an Australian can represent Canada. <laughs> Very well, abroad. Anyway, right on. Uh, Old question. Oh, look, thanks very much to both of you for a, a great talk. I was reluctant to raise these questions. I have two. But uh, as the discussions uh, drifted a little, and have, as both of you are representing Canada in your different ways, I'll nevertheless ask them. It used to be said in Australia years ago that there was a marked difference between Canada and Australia in the sense that Canada felt far less uh, was much more at ease than Australia in criticising the United States. And this was particularly in the 1960s. And as you say, there are similar similarities. We're both Commonwealth countries and all the rest of it. Um, so why is this so? Well, I think I was confronted with my first geopolitical lesson because the answer then was, well, look, it doesn't matter what the Canadians say to the Americans, the Yanks are not going to go away. Uh, nor will they quickly abandon the idea that the security of Canada is the security of the United States. And in saying that, I'm mindful that the dew line, as they call it, which the Americans believe gives them advance warning of a missile attack on the Great Republic, uh, is located way north of most of the Canadian population. So is it the case that you're freer to criticise the Americans simply because they're next door? 
The other question is a much quicker one. What on earth happened to the Kuwakwa movement? I know there were a number of referendums about Quebec separating from uh, the Canadian Commonwealth, but we don't hear anything about that now. Where's that all gone? <laughs> so maybe answering, answering them in, in order, I, 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 think, I think our closeness to the US is maybe why we feel a little more comfortable because it's like family members, right? Uh, we have an expression in French, we say qui aime bien châti bien, so when you love someone you can be quite critical and that's proof of, of the love that you have for that person. I think that maybe sums up the relationship, the Canada-US relationship. I mean. Yes, we are, we are, we know that no matter what, we are stuck together on the continent, uh, but at the same time, I think we, uh, we do have a lot of respect for each other, but we can be also critical, and part of the trust in that respect is also the ability to, uh, to be frank with each other. And so the Mouvement uh, Québécois, it's still, it's still very much alive. Uh, uh, politically, well, I, I guess it's, uh, uh, it, it goes in phases, uh, but uh, Le Bloc Québécois uh, federally is still in, a, it's one of the main party in parliament, in the federal parliament, the Bloc Québécois, and the Bloc Québécois is, is man, most manda main mandate is to defend the interest of Quebec with a view of eventually uh, a, a sovereign Quebec. And, and provincially, uh, I guess there are two parties that are advocating for uh, Quebec's independence. They're not, it's not the main party in power, but they're, they're, um, they're still, a, a, you know, uh, some, some Ke Quebecers would feel very strongly that this is still the, the option that they would like to see. But it is, uh, it is like uh, any sort of well-functioning democracy. <laughs> Every point of view is, 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 um, is, is respected. And, and, uh, and the conversation is ongoing, but it is, uh, yeah, I don't, we don't, yeah, I think that's all I can say at this point. Thank you. <laughs> and I think we're right on time. Yeah. <laughs> no. Thank you both so much for such interesting discussions and such interesting answers to a lot of really great questions. Um, next week, we'll be publishing our next edition of the newsletter, Columns from Gubber Cottages. Uh, before our next event on August 1st here back at Cottages, which will be Dr. Wei Hanzu speaking on the World Trade Organization. To formally end tonight's proceedings, I'd like to invite one of our interns, Imogen Biggins, to deliver a vote of thanks. Um, on behalf of everyone here at the Institute, I would like to say thank you very much. Um, merci beaucoup pour vos discours très intéressants. Um, they were really wonderful talks. Uh, I know as a student of international and global studies, cultural diplomacy is certainly something that we focus on a lot. Uh, and it was really interesting to see that in action tonight. So by way of moving a formal uh, vote of thanks, um, may I offer an applause to our speakers this evening. But we don't hear anything about that now. Where's that all gone? <laughs> so maybe answering, answering them in, in order, I, 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 think, I think our closeness to the US is maybe why we feel a little more comfortable because it's like family members, right? Uh, we have an expression in French, we say qui aime bien châti bien. So when you love someone, you can be quite critical and that's proof of, of the love that you have for that person. I think that maybe sums up the relationship, the Canada-US relationship. I mean, yes, we are, we are, we know that no matter what, we are stuck together on the continent, but at the same time, I think we, uh, we do have a lot of respect for each other, but we can be also critical, and part of the trust in that respect is also the ability to, uh, to be frank with each other. And so the Mouvement uh, Québécois, it's still, it's still very much alive. Uh, uh, politically, well, I, I guess it's, uh, 
Uh, it, it goes in phases, uh, but uh, Le Bloc Québécois uh, federally is still in, a, it's one of the main party in parliament, in the federal parliament, the Bloc Québécois, and the Bloc Québécois is, is man, most manda main mandate is to defend the interest of Quebec with a view of eventually uh, a, a sovereign Quebec. And, and provincially, uh, I guess there are two parties that are advocating for uh, Quebec's independence. They're not, it's not the main party in power, but they're, they're, um, they're still, a, a, you know, uh, some, some Ke Quebecers would feel very strongly that this is still the, the option that they would like to see. But it is, uh, it is like uh, any sort of well-functioning democracy. <laughs> Every point of view is, 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 um, is, is respected. And, and, uh, and the conversation is ongoing, but it is, uh, yeah. I don't. We don't. Yeah. I think that's all I can say at this point. Thank you. <laughs> and I think we're right on time. Yeah. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you both so much for such interesting discussions and such interesting answers to a lot of really great questions. Um, next week we'll be publishing our next edition of the newsletter, Columns from Gubba Cottages. Uh, before our next event on August 1st here back at Cottages, which will be Dr. Wei Hanzu speaking on the World Trade Organization. To formally end tonight's proceedings, I'd like to invite one of our interns, Imogen Biggins, to deliver a vote of thanks. Um, on behalf of everyone here at the Institute, I would like to say thank you very much. Um, merci beaucoup pour vos discours très intéressants. Um, they were really wonderful talks. Uh, I know as a student of international and global studies, cultural diplomacy is certainly something that we focus on a lot. Uh, and it was really interesting to see that in action tonight. So by way of moving a formal uh, vote of thanks, um, may I offer an applause to our speakers this evening. Thank you.